the pastor was at the uh, door of the church. It was a big Southern Baptist church. And uh, as he looked uh, in the hallway, he saw someone coming down that he hadn't seen for some time. And so he walked up and he shook his hand. He said, hello, brother. You need to be a part of the Lord's army. And uh, he was a little taken back. And he said, well, uh, I am a part of the Lord's army. And the pastor said, well, that, that's great, brother, but it seems like I, I just don't see you enough. It seems like only on holidays and maybe an occasional Sunday that I, that I really see you. And the guy leaned over and whispered in the pastor's ear, I'm in the secret service. Well, all too often we do find ourselves uh, falling back into the place of uh, the secret service, not as uh, vitally involved as we should be, but the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, that to every single person to whom the gift of salvation has been given, they have also been given a gift, uh, a capability. Uh, a spiritual way and means of serving the Lord, and uh, that it takes each and every one of us working together to uh, accomplish the goals that God has for us. Open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to continue on in verse uh, 7. Paul tells us that Christ has gifted the church with gifted people and gifted uh, individuals, and that each and every person has been given something special from God in order to serve him, that we might all come to the fullness of Jesus Christ. A person trusts in Jesus Christ for their salvation. They understand that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, that Jesus died for their sins, that he was buried, that he rose again. And by trusting Jesus Christ, they become a part of God's family. They become a Christian. And as part of that salvation process, God gives them a special spiritual enablement. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, but to each one of us, each and every one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, although we are saved by grace, and the grace of salvation is a gift, and the grace that is given in this context deals with the spiritual gifts that are given to us by Christ to equip us to serve him, all of the Christian life is a part of God's gift, God's grace, God's riches given to each and every one of us. And all gifts, as we learn from 1 Corinthians, are of equal importance. And that's why we really don't need anybody in the secret service. We need each and every person serving and doing what they can. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. He says in verse 8, Therefore it says, and Paul will quote now or summarize from Psalm 68, he says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, Paul pulls out of the Old Testament a quote, and uh, it's difficult to understand what this verse fully means without looking at the entire Old Testament passage of Psalm 68. But the figure is that of an ancient Near Eastern king. When they would return from battle, there were certain things that were kind of a protocol that they needed to do. Uh, one thing was that they would parade their captives in front of them. The conquered kings, the conquered leaders would be uh, put before them so that the people could see the conquered people. At the same time, all of the plunder, all of the gifts, all of the wealth that would have been uh, generated through the war, not like today. <laughs> uh, today it costs you to go to war. We're going to hear about $100 billion or so. Um, but it's the price you have to pay at times. But in ancient Near Eastern times, they would plunder the enemy, and then they would bring the gifts back, and they would give the gifts to all the people. For the essence was that the people 
had sponsored or supported the war. And so this is the imagery that we find in Psalm 68. But turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 68, back there in the Old Testament, because we need to understand the psalm as a whole to understand the point that Paul is making. Uh, psalm 68 is a psalm of David, uh, written to the choir director, and it is a song of God's deliverance. In verse 1, it says this, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad, let them exalt before God. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, and exalt before him. God is a father of the fatherless, a judge for the widows. Is God in his holy habitation? God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. It's the imagery of God liberating a people. God bringing forth those that were under oppression, particularly the fatherless, the orphans, and the widows who were the most neglected in ancient Near Eastern society, who were abused and misused, and liberating them and providing for them and blessing them. Verse 7, O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth quaked, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. You confirmed your inheritance when it was parched, your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O God. Verse 11, the Lord gives the command. The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. Kings of armies flee, they flee. And she who remains at home will divide the spoil. When you lie down among the sheepfold, you are like the wings of a dove protecting, covering with silver and its pinions with glistening gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, it was snowing in Solomon. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you look with envy, O mountains, with many peaks, at the mountains which God has desired for his abode? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. And now is the quote. You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also. The Lord may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens, the God who is our salvation, Selah. God is, the, is uh, to us a God of deliverances. And to God the Lord belongs escaping from death. Surely God will shatter the head of his enemies. In this psalm of David, David is seen uh, first of all, himself as victorious over his enemies, but secondly, God providing victory and providing deliverance for the people. Now, within the context of Ephesians and when in the context of the Bible of the New Testament, then who are these people or who are these things that are being conquered by Jesus Christ? As the Apostle Paul takes this psalm and he applies it to the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, the scriptures tell us clearly that Jesus Christ has conquered three very important enemies. He has conquered Satan, he has conquered sin, and he has conquered death. In our lives, we need to understand that there is a cosmic conflict that there is a battle for the souls and the lives of people between good and evil. And the henchman that is at the head of all evil is a fallen angel by the name of Satan. We will see in Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and we have spiritual warfare. Uh, people are naive at times to it, but there is a struggle 
in life and the evil of this world is more than just the greed of humankind, but it deals with an angelic realm that desires to destroy the souls of people and the nations of the world. The second thing that Jesus Christ conquered was sin. For when we trust in Jesus Christ, we receive a new nature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And the bondage of sin is broken. And now we can begin to live lives that are righteous and good and holy. And we can do things that are pleasing to God because he has put his spirit to dwell within us. And then finally, he has conquered death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Oh, death, where is your sting? <laughs> that sting is gone. For death is but the beginning of eternal life. Death is but the final healer for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, If you hear my words, even though you are dead, you shall live. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Yes, Jesus Christ has come, and he has conquered spiritual warfare, personal sin, and he has conquered death. He has also liberated those in captivity. For while we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, Jesus Christ died for us to set us free from sin. And that bondage is broken. Paul goes on in verse 9 of Ephesians. He says, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? What does it mean when he says he who ascended also descended? There are uh, three major views as Bible students look at this passage. Some think it refers simply to his incarnation, that Jesus Christ came from heaven, the fully God became fully man, the virgin birth, the incarnation, he became flesh, and he was here upon the earth. Uh, there are others who think it's a reference to the sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, as we read in Acts chapter 2, when God uh, sent uh, the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and to work in our lives and to empower us in Christian living. But I think the best view is the understanding of the lower parts of the earth. At the time between the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension, we are told in 1 Peter chapter 3 that he descended into the lower parts of the earth to make a proclamation. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 3 and beginning at verse 18 to understand this uh, fairly difficult passage. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 and we'll read through verse 22. It says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. That's the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ, right? He died once for all humanity, for all history, for all time, that he might bring those who are unjust, each and every one of us, for all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not. The just one died for us, the unjust. Why? So that he might bring us to God, so that we might be a part of God's family having put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in or by the Spirit, in which also he went and he made a proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept warning in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. You remember in the Old Testament time that Noah, a preacher of righteousness, for 120 years proclaimed the gospel, the good news of that day, that people needed to know God, that they needed to turn from their sinful ways, and that they needed to trust God. 
And during that entire time, only eight people, Noah's family, trusted and believed. And because of that, the flood, universal flood, came upon the earth. It's still difficult to understand why people don't believe in this universal flood. There is so much geological evidence. There is so much topological evidence. There's been so many sightings of the ark. But you see, people choose not to believe because to believe a story like Noah is to believe that there really is a God and he's a God who's going to hold humanity accountable. It's called denial. <laughs> Lots of people use it to deal with problems. But problems don't go away through denial. And uh, those who have died, the scripture tells us that they are kept in a place called Hades for future judgment. And uh, Jesus Christ went during this time and he proclaimed his victory over Satan's sin and death. Verse 21, he says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, not the childhood infant baptism or the catechism baptism or even a baptism in a baptistry like we have. That isn't what does it. But it is a baptism that is an appeal to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the baptism we were talking about last week in the first chapter. There's one baptism. It is that baptism that when we trust Jesus Christ, we are placed into God's family. And God's spirit is placed into our lives. Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Paul is looking at this great cosmic event that happened after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ when he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended into heaven, he ascended as the great conqueror, having defeated spiritual forces, having defeated sin, and having defeated death. Verse uh, 10 of Ephesians chapter 4 says, He who descended is himself also. He who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things or fulfill all things. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Verse 14, therefore, Hebrews uh, 4.14 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. confession. Hebrews 7.26, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Where is Jesus Christ today? He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's awaiting that time when God the Father will send him back for a second time, a second time to bring his kingdom to this earth. That is the victor that we have. That is the head of the Lord's army. That's our uh, General Franks, in a sense, for us spiritually. Jesus Christ has conquered Satan, sin, and death. And he is at the right hand of God the Father in the command center of the universe awaiting the time when God will send him back to bring in his final kingdom. Now, as Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, Paul says to us, just like in the ancient Near Eastern time when conquerors would distribute gifts to the people, verse 11, he provided gifts for his family, for his body, for his church. In Ephesians 4.11 it says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. Paul mentions four what I would call foundational gifts for the establishment of the church. Now, some people also see these as offices. There's the office of apostle. There's the office of prophet. There's the office of pastor. There's the office of teacher. But um, Paul is not just talking about offices here. He's talking about gifted people whom Jesus Christ has provided to help 
to do something in his great program. And the great program of God is to equip people, to train people in order to serve him and further his kingdom. Now, what is an apostle? Well, we know apostles in the New Testament as those men of authority who provided leadership in the church, in the early church. Uh, They were in some ways uh, missionaries as they went out establishing churches and establishing the teaching. They were commissioned representatives who would go out and tell others about Jesus Christ. Uh, Are there apostles today? I don't think so, not like we had in the New Testament period. Not apostles who speak directly for God, who receive direct revelation from God. Um, and we've seen in Ephesians that the church was, a, was founded on the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. Remember, it didn't say apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. It says the church was founded on the apostles and the prophets. And these were the ministry gifts that brought us what we call our Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, and provided us the scriptures that we have today. And so I don't think we have apostles today. But they were commissioned people, many of them commissioned directly by God, especially the 12 disciples, or 11 of the 12, plus the third one added, uh, or the 12th one added after the uh, removal of uh, Judas. And uh, they provided an authoritative basis for the revelation of God. The second one is prophets. And uh, prophets in the New Testament period, they weren't just preachers. They weren't just teachers. It was a special gift of someone who received revelation direct from God. In the early church, they didn't have a New Testament. They only had the Old Testament. They didn't have the revelation of all the mysteries of God. And so these prophets uh, fulfilled a... uh, transferring role, a transitional role in which they received revelation from God and they provided that. There are people today who would like to claim that they are prophets from God. Sometimes they're just uh, energetic preachers. Other times they claim that God speaks audibly to them. But I question, I wonder, for the New Testament indicates that prophets were for that early period, providing revelation to the people. Uh, Another gift is that of evangelists. And we see that uh, Stephen and Philip and Matthew and Timothy and others were evangelists. These were people who were specially gifted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Now, the New Testament tells every one of us to share the good news with Jesus Christ. You don't have to have the gift of evangelism to do that. But the evangelist was somebody who was usually, in a sense, full-time, fully set apart for the work of the ministry. And, of course, um, the greatest evangelist of uh, our generation uh, that we all know about is Billy Graham. His son Franklin now taking up the uh, mantle. But there are others that we see of people uh, who, not on such a great scale or grand scale, but individuals who just have a gift to be able to reap that fruit. There's some people who will, you know, spend their whole lives sharing the gospel, planting seeds, watering, talking to someone, and then there's those evangelists who seem to have that gift of being able to reap that fruit and and uh, bring people to a final understanding of Jesus Christ. But you have to have those evangelists if you're going to grow a church, if you're going to start a church. If I were to look today, I would say that probably within those people who are missionaries, uh, these would particularly be people with uh, the gift or the calling or the responsibility of evangelism. The next gift is that of pastor. And uh, some think it's one gift, pastor-teacher, for in the original language, it's the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and then it says the pastor and teacher. And because there's no the before teacher, they think it's maybe one combined gift is pastor-teacher. But I'm not convinced of that. Uh, uh, Certainly in our 
uh, church and in the lists of gifts in the scriptures, the teacher is mentioned as a separate gift. The pastor was someone who uh, assumes uh, leadership over a group of believers. It's pictured as Christ is the shepherd of the church. It was a leader who would look over the spiritual welfare and the care in the community of the church. And of course, the metaphor comes from a shepherd who would watch over the sheep. Yes, uh, pastors uh, are given to the church uh, for the equipping of the saints, we will see. Thirdly, there, or fifthly, there was the teacher. And the teacher was the one who primarily expounded on the scriptures, explained the scriptures, explained the practical application of the scriptures. And so you have five gifts, uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. These five working together for a common goal. And the goal is mentioned in verse 12. The goal is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ. The word equipping is an interesting word. It's used in two different ways. In the medical field, it was used of healing a bone, of uh, setting a broken arm. It was used of putting something back together within the human body that was out of joint. And this would deal in the sense maybe with the idea of repairing. For each and every one of us, uh, when we come to Jesus Christ, uh, as sinners, there are things that need fixing. There are things that need setting and repairing. The other use was uh, often in a military context, of uh, that of equipping a person, providing them all of the gear that they needed for whatever the task that was before them. Just as we've been watching the television uh, and you see our military men and women with all of that gear, I mean, it's just fascinating, isn't it? You see them getting off the planes and, and they've got these big helmets and on the helmets are like cameras and all kinds of things hanging all over. And I mean, they've got vests with a hundred pockets in them and stuff hanging all over and these great big you know, backpacks, and, and uh, they are fully equipped with everything they need, except those, what they call them, MRE males. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like the guys are missing them all that much. So, um, but they're well supplied and well equipped. And that's the purpose of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, to train, to equip, to prepare the saints for the work of the service or for the work of ministry. Now, some have taken this in a too great a division, and they've created what they call a clergy and a laity, a professional class and a volunteer class. And uh, this is not the emphasis of the scriptures. If you look at the other passages that speak of spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 4, there's no such dichotomy or division. Uh, you can have the gift or the responsibility of being a pastor and not be in full-time work or have gone to seminary or anything like that. You can be an evangelist and not be a missionary. You can be a teacher and not be fully employed. It's just that there are some gifts that are given to train all of the others. And so these gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of service, for the ultimate goal of to building up the body of Christ. That's the goal, is that each and every one of us, having been given a spiritual gift, will build each other up, will encourage each other in spiritual living, and will encourage each other in service. Now, the word here that is used for service was used of charitable giving, of aid, support. It was used of preparing meals and uh, that to help others. It was also used of specific tasks, of, of helping those who are sick, of helping those who are poor, helping those who are uh, uh, spiritually distraught, those who are emotionally uh, wounded. 
we are all to work together for the building up of the body of Christ. It says in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Notice how Paul's talking about this y'all. This is a great sermon for a southerner to be able to just say y'all or we all or something. For it's not an individual thing. It's each and every one of us needing to work together to bring our resources together. Again, as we look at the pictures of our uh, current conflict in Iraq, you find how absolutely interdependent each one of these units are to each other. The Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force, they are all interdependent on each other for their safety and for their well-being and for the accomplishment of their task. And so it is, as believers in Jesus Christ, we all are needed that we might attain to the unity of the faith. The unity of the faith was mentioned in the earlier part of chapter 4. One Lord, one baptism, one Father, one Spirit, so on and so forth. To the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature person, a mature man, not mature people, but he looks at it as a corporate whole, as a mature person, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's our goal. We all together must all seek to arrive together as one mature person, and that mature person is the fullness of Christ. We all work together. Verse 14. He says, as a result of this, we are no longer to be children. Now, in this particular context, this is a kind of, um, I wouldn't use the word derogatory, but embarrassing situation or embarrassing world word. Uh, none of us, likes to hear words like immaturity. And yet uh, Paul uses this term uh, immature or child when he speaks of people who have been Christians for a long enough time and they just haven't grown up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, I, I wanted to speak to you as spiritual people, but I had to speak to you as children, as immature, because... You just haven't learned yet. He says, if we are all growing together, if we are all serving together, if we are all being built up into the body of Christ, the knowledge of the Son of God, into the stature of the fullness of Christ, then we're not going to be like children, immature, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. Paul says if you're growing up, if you're maturing, you're not going to be tossed about by foolishness, by deceit, and by false doctrine. Tossed here and there is a term that describes a ship in the water being bounced about. I think I shared with you the story, but it's a good illustration again of years ago when uh, Dan and uh, Catherine were just, uh, I, I, I got to go back to the video or the slides to just figure out how old they were. But I don't think Dan was maybe about six or seven, and that makes Catherine, you know, about three or four. And we were over in the Muskegon area camping. And one morning I decided we would get up and take the little, 16-foot boat out onto Lake Michigan, and we would shoot down to Grand Haven. And we would just explore. And so we got up in the morning, and uh, we got out and on our way, and I think I'm sure that I left Jessica or uh, Joanna behind. But uh, we shot down to Grand Haven. It was a, the, the Lake Michigan was an, like glass, as calm as could be, like next to no waves. And, of course, with that little you know, 40 horse motor, power motor, I shot down the lake and we got down there in about a half an hour and we pulled in and we went back and we explored all of these other lakes that were back there and had a great old time and then we came out of there about three or four hours later and I was going to head back and Lake Michigan was back to its waves 
I mean, the wind was coming and the waves were crashing and I'm in Grand Haven and I got to make it back up to Muskegon. And we really got tossed around. I remember uh, holding on to Catherine very tightly and, and Dan was holding on to the uh, front, of the, <laughs> front of the windshield and everything and we just bounced our way back all the way. We were just tossed about by the winds and uh, the waves. And, and that's the description that Paul has here. People who aren't growing as a corporate body in the knowledge and the ministry and the service of the Lord are going to get all bounced around in life. The second word that he uses, bounced around or carried about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, this describes, as, this was used of a weather vane. Uh, you know those weather vanes. I, I was always fascinated by them as a kid, loved to watch them. Where they would just point wherever the wind blew. And of course, if it was an uh, extremely uh, uh, uncertain wind, you'd see that thing blowing and spinning and changing every different direction wherever the wind blew. Uh, that's the description of a person who isn't serving the Lord, who isn't growing together, who isn't finding the knowledge of the Lord. They're just tossed about by the waves. They're blown in whatever direction the wind sends them. By every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. You know, there's lots of people out there trying to trick us, deceive us, and craftiness and scheming to get us to believe lies. The word for trickery was used of a dice game, and it was particularly used of loaded dice. We all know about loaded dice, uh, how uh, they are uh, doctored so that they uh, come up with certain numbers so that you, what's that name of that game where you throw the dice and, what is it? You, now, you shouldn't know that. <laughs> so, somebody told you about that. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Okay. Um, elders, did you notice who else happened to know that game? We'd like to talk with them after. Are you, have you been tithing your winnings? That's the question. And this is the word that was used for that, for loaded dice and for people who would scheme. And, and there's lots of books out there. There's lots of programs out there. There's lots of things out there that would try to take you away from the sound teaching of the Bible. And, uh, you know, again, I, I periodically turn on, like, uh, public television and, you know, Channel 56 and everything, and they have these uh, New Age spiritual gurus on there and others. And I just, I wonder to myself, what, how do people believe this? You know, or how about the Raelians, you know, who are claiming that uh, they have uh, uh, genetically cloned children and uh, that, you know, Jesus Christ was an alien, dropped, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, talk about needing faith to believe something. But in the experiences of life, if you are not grounded in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and if you are not grounded in the service and the work of the body of Christ as a whole, you're going to be tossed around. You're going to be carried around. You're going to be tricked, and you're going to be deceived. Verse 15, he says, But instead of that, you must speak the truth in love. Now, some think it's easier to avoid the truth, to deny the truth, or to speak or to not speak the truth so that their own personal peace is not disrupted. It's very hard to speak the truth in love. But that's what we have to do. For you're not helping anybody by allowing them to live a lie. You're not helping anybody to allow them to be deceived. You're not helping anybody also if you speak the truth in anger and in condemnation. 
We need to speak the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love is very difficult at times. And it's very uncomfortable. But it's the best thing to do for all involved. Proverbs says, open rebuke is better than love concealed. And if you really love somebody, you have to speak the truth to them. If we speak the truth to them in love, it says we are going to all grow up in all aspects in Christ, who is the head, even Christ. In every aspect of life, we will grow if we grow in our knowledge, in our service for the Lord. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together. These are words to describe ligaments and joints. Uh, being held together, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. It causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself once again in love. Brothers and sisters, we're in this thing together. (laughs) And if we're not all in it together and working together, then we are not going to grow together to the fullness and the maturity that we are to have in Jesus Christ. Now, God has equipped each and every one of us with at least one spiritual gift. We need to learn about our spiritual gift. We need to seek to use our spiritual gift so that we will all grow together. If I were to ask you this morning, what is your spiritual gift? Would you know? Again, four main passages, and we're going to talk about them more as we go through Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, um, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12. And if you know what your spiritual gift is, are you using your spiritual gift? If you're not using your spiritual gift, what are your excuses? And the fact is, the matter is, there is no excuse. For God has called each and every one of us to serve the Lord with our spiritual gifts. And in the coming weeks, as we continue to look at Ephesians, Paul's going to challenge us to say, what are you doing for the Lord? How are you serving the Lord? Whether it's in the church or outside of the church, what are you doing for the kingdom of God? And what are you doing as part of God's body to help everyone to grow? Now, we've all had experiences at one time or another when something wasn't working right in the body, whether it was a joint or an arm or a leg or the ears or, you know, eyes or something. And when one part of the body isn't functioning, we know how it impacts all of the rest. Uh, Maybe another illustration. Um... We've probably all at one time or another had a vehicle that uh, maybe had eight cylinders, maybe had six cylinders, maybe had four cylinders, but one of those cylinders wasn't working right. You remember driving something like that? I mean, I, I remember having a vehicle where you'd put your foot on the gas and you'd wait about 30 seconds for it to respond because it only was working about four and a half of six cylinders. And the performance just wasn't there. In order for us as a church, in order for us as a body, to be able to really move forward together. Now, this is not an individual car. This is one great bus that we're on. We need all of the cylinders to be hitting. And in the coming weeks, I hope that we will all find our place, our gift, and our service to the Lord. For unless we do it together we will not grow into the fullness of Christ as we should.